Today, we are delighted to have Skip Fennell, Beth Cobet, and John Ray. Francis Skip Fennell is emeritus as the L. Stanley Bowlesby Professor of Education and Graduate and Professional Studies at McDaniel College in Maryland, where he also directed the Elementary Mathematics Specialist and Teacher Leaders Project. He is a former classroom teacher, principal, and supervisor of instruction, and the past president of the Association of Mathematics Teacher Educators, the Research Council on Mathematics Learning, and the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. He is a recipient of the NCTM Lifetime Achievement Award and Maryland Council of Teachers of Mathematics Lifetime Achievement Award. Skip is also the author of several Corwin Mathematics titles. Beth McCord Cobet is a professor of education and dean at Stevenson University, where she leads, teaches, and supports early childhood, elementary, and middle pre-service teachers in, math in mathematics education. She is a former classroom teacher, elementary mathematics specialist, adjunct professor, and university supervisor. She recently completed a three-year term as an elected board member for the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics and was former president of the Association of Maryland Mathematics Teachers Educators. Beth is also the author of several core and mathematics titles, which foster a strengths-based community with students and strive to facilitate lessons that spark curiosity and cultivate positive, productive struggle. Jonathan Ray is the coordinator of secondary mathematics for the Howard County Public School System. He leads the implementation of mathematics instruction and engages teachers and administrators in professional learning opportunities focused on equity-based and effective teaching practices and instructional leadership. John served as the project manager of the Elementary Mathematics Specialist and Teacher Leader Project and was elected and was an elected member of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics Board of Directors. He is a former classroom teacher, teacher mentor, and past president of both the Association of Maryland Mathematics, Teacher Educators, and the Maryland Council of Teachers of Mathematics. John is co-author of The Formative Five and the newly published The Formative Five in Action, which is the focus of today's webinar. And now, please welcome Skip, Beth, and John. Well, actually, welcome to all of you. Uh, we're, we're just delighted that um, on the Monday before uh, an important holiday in this country, uh, many of you have chosen to join us. And so we appreciate that. We've had all the introductions. Let me just linger a little bit on, on the importance of our title because we're going we're gonna to attempt to connect very carefully issues related to classroom-based formative assessment and feedback. And hopefully these techniques will both engage, inform, and encourage you as you work with other teachers and children. Okay. So here's our plan. We want to we want uh, all of you and and frankly us engaging with you to think about uh, and engage in activities to demonstrate the importance of classroom-based formative assessment, um, not summative assessment, not not stuff that you're going to buy, but but things you direct at the classroom level. So we're, we will consider and reflect on how regular, and that means everyday use of classroom-based formative assessment techniques truly informs your planning and instruction every single day. We also want, it's important for us to, to uh, make sure that you recognize the important connection between your assessments and the feedback you give to your students, as well as the opportunities that you provide for students to, to give feedback to you and to each other. OK, so this has been a somewhat of a long journey for us, uh, as was indicated by Margaret. I did serve from 2006 to 2008 as president of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And during that time, uh, I was teaching graduate courses in, in assessment and formative assessment became very important to me. Uh, and so I, I, in particular, entitled purposely a president's mes message that it, that says go ahead, teach to the test. Frankly, to get people there and say, what are you talking about? But more importantly, to realize that formative assessment done right engages you in, if you will, testing every moment of your instructional day. That led to some articles in uh, a journal that we don't have anymore, Teaching Children Mathematics, 
led to an early publication, 2017, of the Formula Five, which was way more popular than, frankly, we had ever in intended or thought about, and led to uh, what we might call the newer improved edition that really takes a hard look at issues related to, to feedback and conception, um, as, as well as uh, other issues that teachers face with regard to uh, classroom-based formative assessment, okay? So why this and why now? Um, and and let's, let's consider this a three-step approach. First of all, there's clearly a need to emphasize and truly enhance the use of classroom-based formative assessment. We saw that need. We heard about that need. As was mentioned by Margaret, for years I directed and John was the project manager and, and Beth the project lead consultant. Um, this project dealt with elementary math specialists and forever they were coming to us about the need for uh, help, if you will, with regard to helping their teachers, assisting their teachers in the area of formative assessment, hence the need. We also saw and continue to see a tremendous overload. Google sometime, uh, just for the heck of it, John, here it comes. Google formative assessment and you'll find how many, John? Like 69 million results. And, and, and a lot of those you would never think about, even consider putting putting in, in your classroom or thinking about. So we saw that uh, of, of people attempting to, to get to an issue without really understanding it. And we also see in all candor a, a, a focus on surface level formative assessment tricks. Beth Covet has a favorite of mine that I won't have her do in, in front in front of you know all of you because it'll it'll take too much time, but trust me, as she would indicate, there's lots of tricks out there. So what we did was distill a seemingly endless number of uh, formative assessment ideas and suggestions to a, to a small palette of five formative assessment techniques that that we've been uh, that we certainly piloted and investigated for at a very deep level in schools, and that have become to us the formative five that will guide this discussion. It was really well summarized, Skip. So we use the following definitions of formative Thank you, John. assessment. You're welcome. We use the following definitions of formative assessment. The first of which on the left comes from the work of Paul Black and Dylan William. So encompassing all those activities undertaken by teachers and or their students. So wait, let's pause here for a sec. So formative assessment isn't just an act in which teachers engage in. It also involves students which provide information to be used as feedback. So a key here that serves as a thread throughout the formative five in action is just that feedback to modify the teaching and learning activities in which they're engaged. And we, and we also examine the definition on the right that's provided by the Council of Chief State School Officers. A, key action verb, past tense, planned ongoing process used by all students and teachers and note, and maybe just a coincidence, but I think it's very interesting, the order of students before teachers and also the notion of all students and all teachers during learning and teaching. And that's interesting because there's that order again, seems like students before teachers is purposeful, but I might be just reading into it a little bit too much to elicit and use evidence of student learning to improve student understanding of intended outcomes and support students to become self-directed learners. And how does one go about helping students become self-directed learners? Well, we think a big part is through effective formative feedback. Skip? So, so very briefly, because because we're going to come at this pretty directly several slides later, but but our formative five uh, essentially are, are, are the following. And, and we think about them as an artist's palette. In other words, as a classroom teacher, there's, there's artistry in what you do every single day, as well as the science of instruction. And so to us, the importance of observations uh, and how you observe and when you observe and what you do with that is is one of our techniques. The use of of, of student interviews, whether whether one on one or small group to give you a, an opportunity to dig deeper re related to something that you have observed. The show me techniques, which we created to really get at, among other things, the use of representations that children would use or should use as they learn um, particular mathematics concepts and ideas. The hinge question, which which comes directly from the work of Dylan William, which we've, if you will, exploded to think about as, as a question that will guide your lesson throughout the lesson if, as you talk about particular points of instruction and perhaps at the end of the lesson in some level of closure from a question perspective. And then, of course, exit tasks. 
not to be confused with an exit ticket, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But these five frame where we're going in terms of techniques that that we know work, um, that that have been uh, truly researched and dedicated in classrooms um, in in our work and and, and are frankly driving this discussion. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so we know many of you are in the classroom currently and you're working directly with mathematics learners. Um, but I want everybody to think about how does how does perhaps um, everyday use of formative assessment influence your mathematics teaching? Is it an everyday component of what you do as you plan and teach, assessing while you teach? Is this even possible? So we'll come back to that, but let's get into a topic I mentioned earlier from the definitions of formative assessment that is critical to making formative assessment actionable, and that's feedback. Beth? Yeah, so my wonderful colleagues have mentioned feedback a couple of times so far, and the the uh, interesting part is that our development of thinking about the importance of feedback and the specificity of when we do it and how we do it became super important as we began to think about this more deeply. And you're looking here at sort of four ideas around it or four attributes around it, and that is about timeliness, timeliness, like how fast we give it, how quickly we give it, or, or even thinking about planning for when we might give it or, or withhold it. I think we've talked a lot about this or we're hearing a lot about it, but it's about the type of feedback that we're receiving, um, that we're giving. And thinking about this notion of most of the time the feedback we're giving is very much, yes, good job, you know, move along, or it's about sort of uh, behavioral. And then this idea of what's the purpose of the feedback? Why am I giving it? And when, and if I'm thinking about that purpose, it's going to really help me strategize about the specific kinds of feedback. And then also who, and we're going to get into this a little bit more, but this idea of, am I thinking about who is giving it? Is it going to be me or could it be other students? And I want you to just look, um, if you don't mind, a little bit about thinking about the social emotional. We have all, and if we had more time, we could think about it. Think about a time when you receive feedback that just propelled you and motivated you to do more and more. Like you were thinking, oh my gosh, that's exactly the feedback I needed to move forward or feedback that you got that really stopped you in your tracks. Okay. Yeah, really well said, Beth. And, and I think about it, it's pretty easy for us to think about or those of us that are in, in the classroom or those of us that are teacher specialists or teacher leaders that are watching colleagues in the classroom. Sometimes it's easy to spot the teacher to student feedback. We want you to be thinking also about um, when and how uh, you've seen or you've even on your own facilitated opportunities for student to teacher feedback. That's that's a little bit different. And then also opportunities for students to give feedback to each other. And think about the following, you know, the quality of the feedback. And are there particular students, like Beth said, who seem to receive more or even less feedback? Back to you, Beth. Thanks, John. So we are super excited about what we're about ready to share with you. And in thinking about the feedback, we're going to go a little bit deeper. In considering the kinds of feedback, and I love that little point that John just made just as he transitioned to this slide, does everyone get this really high quality feedback or are only some students getting it? And when we start to think about the depth of feedback and what it looks like, we also wanna be thinking about how the students are representing their thinking. And so sometimes as teachers, you know, we were taught all of us to just sort of eradicate misunderstanding or misconception and move along. But what we're gonna do is think about this a little bit more deeply and give you some characteristics. So let's take a look. So go ahead, yeah. So for example, I think we're all super comfortable with this idea of a mistake. Um, but we're thinking about that um, this other term that we've used a lot, which is misconception. And misconceptions, you know, really um, 
important to understand, but we're going to get a little bit deeper into this. We're going to talk about understandings as mathematical understandings as simply conceptions. What we want to do is kind of um, think about this a little bit more carefully in terms of using that word misconception, which you sort of throw around for anything that students do who are either understanding or not understanding. So we're going to think about that a little bit more. And then we're also going to be thinking about this. I just love this idea of developmental pathways. Our understanding at any one time is on a pathway. We're anywhere in this sort of range. It's not an all or nothing kind of thing. And when we think about student mathematical understanding in that way, it allows us to give much better feedback. So here we go. You ready? Conception. That's just student understanding. That's what they think about in terms of the mathematics they're thinking about it at one certain point in time. And that feedback me that we're going to be thinking about is going to have to be directed to where they are in that moment. So here's one, mistakes. Everybody makes them. If you haven't made, I've made about 10 today. So if you haven't made one today, let me know. I need to know your secret. These are just small errors and we all make them. If I'm making a mistake, here's some examples of feedback that really help me understand my mistake not just fix something, but understand where that mistake happens. So these are small errors. That's one kind. The next kind, we are really, really excited about this. And I just had this amazing conversation today with my early childhood pre-service students, because in early childhood, this is really pretty much everybody. It's early, naive, or partial conception. This is the beginning, the tentative understanding. The, I kind of have it for a moment, and then it slips away a little bit. I need more time and experience to grapple with the mathematics so it can, bec can become stronger. Examples of feedback for early, naive, or partial conception. Tell me a little bit more about it, because we all know when we start to explain it, our understanding gets more secure. We start to understand what we understand and what we don't understand. And then I love this too. I wonder if we tried that again, would we get the same strategy? Would, would we get the same solution or a different one? And so that's going to also help me move from that sort of partial conception to stronger understanding. Okay, number three, alternative conception. So these are kind of those ideas around that, that happen where we develop an idea and it kind of works once or twice and then they're ready to go for it. It also is very highly connected to rules that expire every time. Whenever you multiply, you get something bigger. Hmm, works for a while, but it doesn't work to so well when I get to fractions. So this idea that I've built an understanding and I'm going to apply it to everything. And here's some really nice examples of feedback that you would give if students were thinking about that. Showing two solved um, work samples and asking which one makes sense and why. And then my personal favorite is matching two students with different understandings and allowing them to do the student to student feedback to grapple with their both their, their understandings or their conceptions of what's happening mathematically. So if you've got all of them, yay. Because <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to take a moment and look at this problem. So this is a vertical task that was given by Amy Lott at Swift Key Creek Elementary in Virginia. And every student in the whole school got um, this vertical task. It was a little bit different for K, K through two, and this is a three through five. So you're gonna see the problem, Claire's placing cookies on plates, 24 of them, and she'd like to put the same number on each plate and each plate will have at least one cookie. What are different ways the cookies could be placed? So this student says she could put three cookies on seven or put seven on three, and then she could also put one cookie on 24 plates. So go, go ahead, throw it in the chat. What do you think? Try it out. Do you think it's a mistake? Do you think it's early, naive, or partial understanding, or conception, or possibly an alternate conception? What do you think? Throw it in there. We got a partial. We got another partial. All right. 
Miss, perhaps a misreading. Partial. Ooh, now we've got a mistake. So early conception. So based. Oh, here they go. They're flying. <laughs> <laughs> did, we do, did we put a time limit on this, Beth? You know how no, I do. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, mode's partial right now. Most partial. Okay, so based on what you put in there, what we want you to do is what would your feedback be? Now, this is so exciting. So your feedback has to match your idea. So we're not going to tell you you're right or wrong. It just has to match your, your idea. So if you think it's a mistake, What's your feedback going to be? If you think it's partial understanding, what would your feedback? Oh, there goes Ashley. Does yeah, your I'll, answer I'll, make sense? I'll go back a couple slides too, in case people okay. want to just kind of scan. Yeah, this is a lot to put together. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Going back forward again. Mm hmm. Okay. So what I'm noticing right now is a lot of feedback is around partial understanding or also maybe we're not so sure. So we want to get more information, which I really love that as well. We're not going to make an assumption, but we're also going to investigate student understanding a little bit more. Ooh, here we go. When we try your idea, will we get the same solution? Here they go. So thinking through what students provide us and using this idea of this developmental pathway of understanding and strategically tailoring <clears throat> our feedback. That's the idea behind this. And it's really, really exciting. And I saw that Nick mentioned this. This is also lifting up the student to have thoughtful interaction with the mathematics. There's a conversation that's going to occur here. This isn't about correcting. It's about understanding. All right, let's check out another one. Ready? Student number two. Love, love this, mm -hmm. uh, this work here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it in a little bit at a time so everybody gets a chance and and uh, bear with me. I'm gonna read it. Uh, knowing that 24 divided by six equals four, arrow to 24 divided by six equals four, by the way, and that arrow to six times four equals 24. Nice inverse operation there. We must divide, I'm still not sure if that's like a carrot or, but anyway, it says A, by six or 24. Okay. I think I'm following it. Everybody following it? Okay, here we go. <laughs> but we can place the cookies in equal groups of six. Got it. In each row for each plate, that's an arrow from the six or four. Okay, so... Groups of six, actually, or four. Okay, I think I think we all got it. So we could do arrow to a plate with, it looks like eight chocolate chips. Actually, I think they're cookies. Arrow to a plate with eight cookies, or we could split cookies up into a half. Hmm. For each cookie on a plate. Hmm. Side note, now I'm bad at this stuff, so I'm completely not, I'm not completely sure. Sorry. So, all right, let's take this one in here. In the chat box, would this be um, an example of a mistake or some mistakes, early, naive, or partial understanding or conception, alternate conception? What do you think? Take a moment and flood the chat. Naive. Mm. Alternate. Interesting. No, mixing up on multiple ideas. Okay. So alternate conception. Interesting. Now Looks like a strong start. Needs to be expanded on, Sarah. I agree. <laughs> Lots of questions. I'd like I'd like to have a conversation, right? All right, good. A lot of partials, some naive. Partial seems to be the mode right now. Any feedback that people might want to give or provide opportunities for, for this student? Are there any other ways to get 24? Great. 
Can you show me? Ooh, using a drawing, Annette, love it. Show me. We'll come to that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm, nice feedback, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very nice. I yeah, like how specific that is. Yeah, four or four. Actually, that was an arrow or four. That took me a little while there, Dara. I would ask him to draw the plates and cookies. Good. All right. Really good feedback. We have one more. Skip, you want to just touch on this one? Yeah, we'll look at it uh, <clears throat> very briefly. Same problem. And, and look what this student did. Um, you know, seemingly every conceivable <laughs> method to, to think about how one might approach this. And um you know, there aren't any right answers here, but um, think of think of your work as a classroom teacher on your feet, getting responses as as we've seen here. And and as as this plays out pretty quickly, deciding where is this student relative to their conceptual understanding? Next, John. So very, very coincidentally, um, Deborah Ball from University of Michigan has also been working on issues related to misconceptions. And, um, you know, as we began doing this revision, we decided early in that process that the phrase misconception is used to, 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 to just throw it, throw it on a wall. This child has a misconception or whatever, rather than let's look at conception, which is what we're, we're doing here and connecting that very directly to feedback. What, what, uh, Deborah has done and, um, some of you may have attended uh, online the IES Math Summit uh, in September of this year. And in her session, she talks about mistakes that are not misconceptions. And she 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 put them in, if you will, boxes. Bookkeeping er errors, Beth alluded to, to one or so uh, early on when she was talking about, we all make bookkeeping uh, errors, even, even those of us, John Ray, that would be me, me who use checkbooks. Um, and uh, we also- I, I, got, I got no comment on that. I know you don't because you've already made it. Um, we also find that, that kids will be answering a different question um, not necessarily the one you intended. We also note that students will make correct responses, but they're different than, than expected. So the notion of reframing error, uh, Deborah's phrase, is, is just something that we're all considering here uh, as we move forward. Okay. So several slides ago, um, we talked about the formative five and, and what they are. Or what um, what I'll be doing in the next several slides is walking you through um, these techniques. Okay. So every every classroom teacher uh, observes every day, uh, and and what the intent is is that you know these observations do indeed provide you with initial links to how formative assessment can and should influ influence your planning and teaching. So our, our intent is to, is to essentially say, of course you're observing all day long every day. Let's, let's use this as a technique that can guide your planning and your teaching as well as think about next steps. And one of those next steps might be an interview. Um, these are brief directed conversations where your focus is on listening, keyword, to understand a student's thinking. Uh, and then, as I indicated uh, previously, the show me technique extends what you have observed, you have observed, and use of the show me is often spontaneous. You're walking in around, around the class and, and students are doing something. Show me how you did that. Um, show me show me that with another uh, problem, or let's use the, these manipulative materials to show me uh, that in a different way. So, so these three techniques are very closely connected. In other words, you're observing, which may which may move you into an interview, which may move you into a show me opportunity. John? Observations. As I indicated, you observe students all day long. How do they truly influence each of the following? One is your ongoing assessment of students. It's now November. 
you began observing your class in September. You have a different perspective now than this. The observing process is cum cumulative and you have a sense of where students are to the point of if somebody asked you how someone is doing, you know that based on, if you will, those cumulative observations. Uh, the feedback and uh, you provide and the timeliness of the feedback is, is directly connected to where that students where those students are with regard to your observations. And then and then truly it impacts your planning. OK, here's where my class is. Here's where this group is. What's next? And next might be tonight as I plan for tomorrow. John. Yeah, as we monitor and observe engaging in strength spotting and comparing what is observed with what was anticipated. Consider opportunities to engage in conversations with students intended to gather information. Wow, this is key. Wow, listening carefully to what students are saying in response to questions. In this quote, this teacher is considering this practice in place of some of the paper and pencil tasks typically used. And Skip and Beth and I found over the years through capturing electronically both written work and the corresponding verbal reasoning of students that the assumptions we make about students' written work alone from an open-ended task are often not always inaccurate, not always accurate in terms of what we hear from students as they respond to follow-up or even interview questions. So consider these interview opportunities as those formative assessment moments that are at the very least a bonus on top of just solely written opportunities to respond to tasks. All righty, so it's your turn again. Um, we're gonna give you a situation in, in terms of thinking about these interviews and feedback. And remember these interviews are, are quite short. Um, they're sort of a lean in kind of interview um, and it's an opportunity to learn more. So here you go. This is the scenario. Students are working on a problem solving task in pairs. And as you're observing, you notice that one pair of students is engaged and they're so lively and so excited, but they haven't written a thing down. Never happens. <laughs> never, never, never. So you say, tell me about your mathematical ideas. And the students quickly begin sharing multiple strategies they're considering. And several ideas of their ideas are strong, but they have still not written anything down. Okay, so we're gonna take three different types and you're gonna choose A, B, or C as we um, look at the scenario. Are you ready? Timing. Okay, what would you do? Would you provide immediate feedback? Would you withhold your feedback until later in the lesson? Or would you provide immediate feedback on the collaborative problem solving behavior? So A is provide immediate feedback on strategies, withhold feedback, or provide immediate feedback on the collaborative problem solving behaviors. Let us hear A, B, or C. Well, the I'm chat. So Here we yeah, go. Yeah, in the chat. Whoa. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. can you okay. keep track of this, John? I'm, I'm, I'm perfect track. <laughs> oh. Yep. It's everywhere, but yeah. I think I'm mostly seeing A and C. Yes. Okay. Now again. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in this particular situation, we're not, again, it's not a right or wrong answer. It's about your purpose of your lesson, what you're thinking about, and of course, what you know about your students. So that's timing. Can we try another one? We're going to think about type of feedback now. Type of feedback would be, are you going to um, give direct feedback? Are you going to suggest, hey, I think you need to use this strategy? Are you going to do uh, use goal-oriented feedback? Or are you going to remind students of the goal of the lesson? Remember what we're doing here? This is what we were doing today. We've been doing this for a couple of weeks. I'd like you to choose a solution pathway, pathway that aligns to that goal. Or C, huh, this is interesting. I'd like to see what you're going to choose. Type of feedback. What do you think? A, B, or C? I'm so interested. What have we got? Can you guys see it? All of a sudden my chat. So, okay, here we go. I'm looking at everything again. But 
this is really an exercise to help you see the different ways and the different kinds of feedback that we might give. Um, my pre-service teachers notice that they are doing the same thing over and over again, and they're not really, they're really trying to think about why and how they're doing it instead of always responding in the same exact way, because we do get into patterns of behavior when we're trying to get feedback. Yeah. A lot of BC, some A's. All right. All righty. Last one, instructional response. So this is your decision in your lesson. Where are you headed? All this is going on. Are you going to just continue the lesson as planned? Oh, well, they'll never write anything down. Are you going to stop the lesson and say, okay, here's what we're going to need you to do. I see that some students have not written anything down. We need to get busy. Or does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> Anyone say that today? Okay. Or are we going to change direction? Are we going to pull everybody together and say, wait, I have a new question for you based on what I'm seeing. I've been observing. I've talked to a couple groups and now I'd like to pose this question. Where are you headed? I see everything. Too. It's, uh, it's B and B and C pretty consistently. So no yeah. one's continue. No one's just marching through the lesson, and that's probably really good because we're thinking really about what do the students need at this moment in time, and what is my what? How can my feedback support the mathematical understanding? Right. Great job, everyone. Yeah. So the use of the the show me technique, and I want to just throw some props out to Annette that used that phrase. Can you show me? Uh, with a drawing earlier, that show me technique, while often spontaneous or in the moment, can be anticipated, just like a student's response to an interview. A student's response to a show me prompt is student to teacher feedback. It's a response to your prompt. Your on the feed analysis of a show me response informs your to teacher to student feedback. But let's think about the reality of such show me responses. And, and the importance of your analysis of the response and the feedback you provide to your students is critical. So take a moment to consider each of these following statements and the reality of these scenarios. Perhaps they happen to you today. Um, classroom teachers, are, are there any of you that maybe encountered these recently? And, and consider also how you might respond. So what would your feedback be? Uh, a response that's provided so quickly that you wonder how the student actually did that or a response that you just don't understand. So we saw that a little bit with student two. Um, and so maybe we would be providing an opportunity for a show me prompt there. Can you show me um, using numbers instead of you know pictures? Or can you show me it with a drawing instead of those words and symbols that you use? A response that uses multiple representations, like a drawing or a table, but was not the response representation-wise expected or requested, or a response that doesn't really show, but it's like an oral statement that seems kind of accurate. Maybe we want to get a little more information, so we pose a show me prompt. One that's partially correct, one that reveals a student's strength behind what you had even anticipated when planning for the use of the show me technique. Those are also um, ones that we see sometimes. And also a response to a class-based show me prompt where seemingly only half the class provides correct responses. And then it's sort of like, uh, you know, where do you go from there with that? Skip. So thanks, John. So we, we've spent a fair amount of time on <clears throat> the first three of the five techniques. We're going to move to the hinge questions. I indicated Earlier, the, the notion of the hinge point or hinge question comes from the work of Dylan William. And as I indicated then, we kind of exploded that to think about how such questions or such a question, depending upon where it's inserted in the lesson, really will help you get an assessment of, frankly, where people are. You're going to ask students about a major element of the day's lesson to see essentially where they are, what they know or understand at that point. Um, and, and of course, as you plan such questions, you're going to adapt questions as needed, which may include changing the language. So, so the notion of, of that and how, how you might change it are really critical to using, uh, using the, the hinge uh, within the context of the lesson. Okay, John. 
So what about you? Um, think about the following relative to your own use of questioning and how you might adapt to or consider using the hinge if you're not already doing that. In your experience with questioning, how do you analyze student responses while teaching? I mean, this is one of the, uh, to me, this is one of the observations of an experienced teacher. That person is, is asking such questions and on their feet, deciding what the feedback might be and how you're going to support students with, with regard to those responses. That's one consideration. A second consideration here is the following. How is the use of, of questioning at particular hinge points within the lesson somewhat, think about this, of a diagnostic activity? You're essentially diagnosing where the students are within that element of the lesson that's going to guide your next steps in terms of, of going forward. And by, by the way, it might guide you to, to sort of stay right where you are because they're not quite ready to take that next step. So you know, not that we have time, but but it would be a good thing uh, as you work with teachers in, in your school or within at the grade level to discuss the importance of supporting, in particular, multilingual learners and or students with disabilities. Because sometimes we forget that the pace of such questioning and the pace of such work would need to be guided uh, appropriately. John? Yeah, just... Um... Hinge are so hinge questions are so interesting because there are a lot of sources that have great hinge questions in them. Some of them are the curriculum materials that you are using in your schools, and others can be found. There's a lot of online sources that have some pretty cool things. Um, they may be in the form of like an open ended kind of question, and you you know they're intended to be posed, uh, you know, whole class rather quickly, assessed pretty quickly. So it might be. Um, using uh, every pupil response. It could be using things like personal whiteboards. It could be using technology tools, but doing that rather quickly. The, 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 the amount of time skip that you do all that is about what? Well, we, we like to say the two minute rule. Uh, in, in other words, you know, when you when you think about use of the the, the hinge in terms of planning, you, you you provide a fair amount of time at, at the at the beginning if you're going to use the multiple choice version. If you're going to use a typical question, you you spend a lot of time in terms of interpreting on the in the other direction. So then again, the the, the connection here to the planning is critical. Um, and yeah, so say the analysis is pretty quick. Yeah, perfect. So open edit. Like Skip said, this is an example of more of a multiple choice selected response kind of question. Um, lots out there. You just want to make sure a couple of things. Number one, in a situation like this where you've got a quick show of hands and maybe you're corresponding A, B, and C or D with the number of fingers, one, two, three, or four, or maybe using a technology tour, like I said, um, holding holding it up on, on a personal dry erase board, or, or, or maybe you're walking around quickly and looking at papers. But um, you know, if if you have a situation where students are not selecting the correct answer, you also want to be thinking about, like, how do you interpret that uh, response? Like, what may be going on there? And Hinge is also another, another good place to combine with some of the other techniques we've talked about. So interviews are appropriate here. Observation is huge here. And a show me prompt. Well, there might be some really, really good opportunities for here. Be thinking about how and when you'd provide teacher to student feedback or even opportunities for student to teach your feedback or opportunities for students to give feedback to each other. Good, good comments on the chat, by the way, relative to the use of questioning in particular. Um, so we've, we've talked about four of the five and that, that leaves us to uh, the exit task, uh, which is essentially providing a sampling of student performance. Often, often the exit task is, it could, could be a closure activity uh, for the lesson. We tend to think that, because these have to be reviewed by you, uh, that teachers will, will more likely use the first four of these techniques every day and, and perhaps the exit task, not, not every day. Uh, there are many resources out there in terms of, of websites and tools that are available as sources for, for good productive tasks. And the word that's important to us here is that, no offense to anyone who likes to use exit tickets, but but we found them to be more trivial than what we would like to communicate by using the phrase exit task. So it's we're looking at something deeper, if you will. We're look, looking at something that is, if you will, more cumulative relative to the lesson. So that's the sense of the exit task. Go yeah, ahead. let's not let's not sell tickets to get out of our math okay. classrooms, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, I apologize 
uh, because they're going to read this. I have a diverse class, many of whom are multilingual learners. So my exit tasks, uh, for my exit tasks, I have my students work in small groups and use varied representations as they work through the exit task of the day. These representations include, as appropriate, tables, graphs, drawings, equations, or just word. I then make my rounds of the group asking for explanations of the task solutions and having the students draw connections between all the representations they use. This way, I can essentially see that all students have been engaged in the task solution and use of the varied representation seems to really help my multilingual students in sharing their thinking important and thinking their, think, their thinking. Importantly, I can provide my feedback to individual students and the group as I make my visit. Uh, this is from a teacher who is working through this and I think it just captured the importance of the exit task and also thinking about engaging multilingual learners uh, in a very direct way. Okay, John. So one of the things that we also think about relative to tasks, uh, and the last slide sort of gets at it in terms of multilingual learners, is, is uh, improving accessibility. And there was a recent article in the Math Teacher uh, K-12 through by Roberts et al. that talked about three research-based strategies for enhancing math tasks to make them more accessible, frankly, to all students. And these, can, these include use, uh, use and, and connect multiple representations, think through language obstacles, um, contextualize math concept, concepts and problem-solving activities to further students' mathematical learning alongside their language development. You know, see the, the, the definite attention to language here. Um, and the question, again, that we don't have the time to deal with as a larger group, but the question for your consideration is, how can you adapt your exit task to include the use of multi-representations? It's sort of like a show me opportunity with inside of uh, the exit task. John? So these are some reminders, and, and that's what they are as you, as you think about regular use of these techniques um, relative to observations. What, what will you expect to observe? That's a question that, that you ask yourself as you anticipate, as you plan. How will you record and provide feedback? And it was mentioned in the chat, and I'll, I'll just take the opportunity to mention here, we have tools for all of these techniques because keeping a record of, of, of what students are doing is pretty important. Relative to interviews, what would make you decide to interview a student or small group of students? In other words, as you observe, what comment, what types of comments, what what sort of solutions? I mean, we've all been there. You would say, whoa, where did that come from? And you want to dig deeper with that students. And that would lead to the, the next one. What interview questions might you ask? How might they be different from multilingual uh, students, learners or students with disabilities? As for show me, what would you use as a prompt for a show me response for a particular lesson? Uh, students' responses to a show me are student to teacher feedback. Think about that. You, here, you gave them the prompt, so they're giving that feedback to you. Relative to the hinge, considering how and when you will use the hinge question and how students will be uh, engaged uh, and assessing student response and providing feedback and deciding instructional next steps are, are to be anticipated as you plan for the use of hinge questions. We, we have nothing to, to, to hide here. As we work with teachers, have worked with teachers over the years, the hinge question is hard because, frankly, questioning is hard. And so, as I as I see, many of you are working with pre-service teachers. Now's the time to start in terms of getting them ready for formative assessment. And relative to to exit tasks, given classroom norms and prior experience, uh, when will you be able to re review them, uh, and and how will you couch them in within the context of a lesson? Go ahead, John. I know we're running late. I guess that about does we're it. right on uh, time. No, we're right on yeah, time. Yeah. So we got a couple minutes for Q and A. People want to post in the chat. We're going to try to take our best shot. I got to catch my breath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd love to hear any questions that you have. Or I'm fascinated by the chat. By the way, yeah, I think we probably could have just opened the chat today and not even done a session and just chatted. I mean, there's so much great knowledge about formative yeah. assessment in here, and I just I Agreed. love the. I love the conversation. There, there was a comment in the chat that I'll, I'll just, you know, deal with um, in a direct way, and that is part of the motivation for this work has been uh, all of our connections to pre-service teacher education, and that is 
mm-hmm. lost in many programs in pre-service teacher education is assessment. Where is that? Mm-hmm. You know, um, we've worked with too many math specialists who, who have told us our my, my beginning teachers have known nothing about assessment. Now I'm generalizing, but there's a tremendous need for to, if you will, take this to the classroom. And you know, I don't want to start with you if I can avoid it when you're a third year teacher. I, I want you in your initial methods classes and, and Beth is teaching them right now to have have the kinds of opportunities that her students are having at Stevenson University. So I think that's that's an issue for the profession. Well, we've got some questions in here. Let's yeah. see if we can um, address some of them. One of them was just a qu- uh, uh, talking a little bit more about the hinge. And um, so let me see if I can uh, try this one. So the hinge is you're teaching a lesson and you kind of have two paths you want to go in. So you're going to ask a, a very strategic question that you want to get feedback from the students, uh, some kind of solution pathway. And then that what you gather from them, so it's usually a whole class question, is going to drive your lesson in one direction or another. Um, and so the hinge question, as Skip said, is the hardest. We could spend a whole hour on it and really dive into it. It is really the hardest. I think we do it a lot, but I don't know that we're always as strategic about what's going to happen. I've often said that the hinge is the lesson deal breaker. You know, you're you're to this point, you want to see where people are and you're asking that and you're getting it. You're going to, you know, we say we had, there's a two minute rule. You phrase it and you get it out there and you're not going to, you're not going to have every, every child answer the question because if you, if you're doing a whole group in a small group, be different, but, but, you know, that's going to guide you in terms of, okay, where am I going? Where am I going right now? Where am I going right now as I finish this lesson or where, where am I going tonight when I put plans together for the next day? So yeah. Um, it's really critical there. Yeah. Hey, Greg asked, do you have examples of exit tasks? And I, and I think uh, a real easy, a easy few, Greg, because I think depending on, I, I don't know what curriculum you use or or what you're using in your school, but like some, some really great places online or like um, inside mathematics at inside mathematics.org um, illustrative mathematics. I'm not talking about the curriculum necessarily. I'm talking about the website, the, the one that's tasks.illustrativemathematics.org um, U cubed. Is is great Joe Bowler's work out in Stanford. So you know, ucube.org slash tasks is another great place. And there's lots of others. People feel free to um, flood the chat. Somebody asked, Scott asked, this is a fascinating question. Beth or Skip, I want to hear your your perspective on this. Do you think there should be a progression from teacher to student feedback, then student to teacher feedback, and finally student to student feedback, or keep it organic? Can I, can I answer that? Um, I, I think that, I think this, first of all, fabulous question. I think when I'm thinking about my own trajectory and learning about it, that I'm going to focus on one at a time, but I think you should be very organic about the purpose of the lesson. So if the purpose of the lesson is for us to gather, maybe it's an introductory lesson, the beginning of a unit, you know, something like that then I'm going to be looking at me giving a lot of feedback, very strategic, strength spotting, that kind of thing. But as I move into the content more and students are building and adapting and and, um, creating and constructing more understanding, I'm going to move them to more student to student feedback so that they can begin giving them. So I don't, I guess I answered that all different ways. Organic. Um, yeah, so organic, but I thought I needed to explain my sort of thought po- process because I've actually thought about this quite yep. a bit. Perfect. All right. Hey, it's uh, it's 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 time for Margaret, I think. All right. Yes. Sorry, Skip. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Thank, thank you, Skip. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, John, for showing us how to leverage formative assessment techniques every single day. So... Um, And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And again, just thank you to Skip, Beth, and John, and for everyone attending today.